<laughs> Hello, Star Wars fans. Hey, did you know there's just 241 days until Christmas 2021? And today we're going to get into a review of the High Republic novel Into the Dark by Claudia Gray. We've got panelists here. Uh, I just want to give you a quick uh, quick. Uh, rundown. We've been on vacation for a little over a week, and uh, today we just came back and uh, excited to be here. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Lord Callus was going to be with us. Uh, it was in touch with him. We knew it was going to be a bit iffy. He had a road trip today and just wasn't able to make it. So we do have some very good uh, uh, panelists today. I'm excited uh, that we've, we've been able to meet some fantastic folks that will be able to discuss this novel. So uh, we'll go around the board and do some introductions. And uh, I think we'll start with uh, one more of you will be familiar with, Gray. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Hello. There, there you go. So Gray has been a member of the Den and Nerds community for a while. She's been a friend of the channel. She's one of our mods here as well. And uh, a dear friend of mine. Uh, very, very thankful to have Gray with us and uh, a, a big consumer of the new uh, canon novels, and uh, we look forward to continuing discussions with Gray as we go forward. Now, we've got two other uh, guests. One of them uh, you may have seen last night, uh, and we want to uh, give him a chance to come on and talk about some uh, content. We're going to talk about uh, the, the High Republic and uh, also consumer of a lot of novels, and uh, if we'll bring on, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself uh, Levi? Well, yeah, you said it best. I'm Levi, and my name hasn't changed since last you may have saw me. Uh, I'm from the channel All New Nerds, and, uh, you know, despite what you, your first impression of me, I am, you know, committed to having conversations and open dialogue, and I'm really happy that Santa brought me on to this uh, lovely discussion, and I'm just excited to talk about the book. Very good. Awesome. And then uh, I sent out a request in the in, in the Star Wars Explained Community Discord. We had a, a person uh, volunteer to come with us, another uh, fantastic guest. Uh, hi, Drelana. Could you uh, introduce yourself? Let folks know a little about who you are. Uh, hello, my name is Hydralana. Unfortunately, I don't have a wonderful Star Wars nook and my basement's ugly, so you're only going to see my avatar's portrait for this uh, occasion. I really deeply enjoy Star Wars. I've been a consuming the can content ever since it started coming out and I believe in loving the high republic so I'm looking forward to talk, talking about this great great and uh so uh, I see we have many of our our regulars on here as well as some new folks uh, the channel's continuing to grow I'm extremely excited about the growth we've had since uh, we had the opportunity to go on with Star Wars theory and uh, it's been super exciting time for me a super exciting time for the community and um, I'm really dedicated to having a, a really uh, 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 healthy conversation among uh, fans. We've, we know there are a huge divide in the fandom and I try to get folks with different perspectives on board. Uh, I was talking earlier uh, and, and wanted to make sure with Levi that we, we're not all just, yep, yeah, I agree. Uh, so we want to have a, a, a good dis, uh, discussion from folks of different backgrounds. So uh, I'm really, really excited to get in tonight. And of course, Into the Dark's been out for a little while. We're not exactly hitting while the, while the fire is hot, uh, but, but we are going to be discussing spoilers. So if you haven't read the book, if you don't want to know uh, all the details, because we will plan to cover all of it tonight, uh, the story, the characters, uh, what happens, and uh, in all of the detail. Uh, if you are uh, uh, interested in reading the book, you haven't yet got to it, uh, uh, please know we'll be discussing spoilers tonight uh, in, in, in great detail. So uh, put that up front. And then, uh, and then secondly, we're going to uh, just kind of work our way through some of the controversies. Uh, of course, this, this novel has uh, raised a few, and Claudia Gray has taken some hits on this one. I think, uh, as I was talking with Hydra a little earlier, <laughs> that uh, some of them are the usual suspects, right? So it's getting a lot of criticism from the usual suspects, but it's also getting some criticism from uh, longtime fans and uh, including theory and 
uh, of course, Josh is a dinner nerd. So uh, just to be fair, it's getting lots. Uh, Freeman Cooper needs to finish the book. So Freeman, we're going to get into the details. No, this might not be the stream for you. Just know you know. Oh, and Star Cabal is here. Star uh, uh, is going to be doing an interview tomorrow. We plan on trying to do a joint stream with uh, Darth Chaco, myself, and Star. And then we'll uh, open the invite for uh, anybody uh, who might want to join us. Uh, and I know uh, Star is interested. If uh, Levi, you're interested, you can join us as well. So we will take a look at that. And Reaver Man Reviews, uh, welcome, Wayne. Good to be, good to see you here. And uh, like <laughs> Mike, rock, yeah. uh, Mike Porter, our our uh, our nerdy, uh, uh, we, we call him Mike the Sandman Porter. He never sleeps. And uh, he's older than Santa. You know, if you're older than Santa, you're older than dirt. If you're older, you might be saying. So we we <laughs> we talk about Mike is everywhere. He gets everywhere, uh, and and so uh, but unlike Stan, he's not uh, uh, itchy and annoying. So <laughs> we're appreciative of that as well. So uh, thank you everybody uh, for being here. And um, yeah, Spencer, from what he read from Claudia, it's the least favorite. Still a good story. Yeah, we're going to get into uh, this. And Abby, Abby's here to to keep you all in line. She's. <laughs> We trust her uh, to help uh, keep the conversation in the chat going well. Hey, Polyhedral Paradise. Good to see you here, Jason. Thanks for coming. And Ducky uh, Momo, uh, thanks. Oh, one of our winners. So we'll. I, I got to get back to that. We've got some toy giveaways that uh, we have, and Ducky's one of them. So uh, we're going to get into, into the dark. Yeah, we, I've read it twice as well. And uh, I want to jump into... Uh, a bit of the characters. We're, and as we go through the characters, we'll discuss the story and how it interacts and uh, we'll let the conversation go wherever it might. Uh, so there, the, the three characters here are, uh, are the, the, the crew of, of, of a ship called the Vessel. And the, this uh, Leox, Affy, and Geode. Uh, I've heard a lot of people calling Geode a, a pilot. Or a co-pilot. That's not the case. Geode's not a pilot, nor a, a co-pilot. Uh, he is a navigator, and, uh, and we'll we'll talk about him in just a moment. But one of the one of the things that comes up about uh, this is the name of the vessel, being the vessel. Uh, that maybe Claudia is getting a little bit lazy because she's not even going through the the work to uh, come up with a, a name of the ship. What do you What are your thoughts of uh, the vessel being the vessel? I thought that the vessel being the vessel was perfectly fitting for the, for um, Leox. Yeah. So to, to tell us about Leox. So there you go. You brought him up. You get to introduce him. He's, he's hippy dippy. If you were to like categorize him, you know, he's, he's a, like a stoner hippie that loves everything and never gets angry. And it's supposed to be deep that his vessel is named the vessel. And with his storyline, I thought it was very fitting. So I wouldn't say that Claudia Gray was losing her touch with the naming because I felt it was very fitting for him. Oh, good. Yeah, and, and they do make a bit of a joke about it. Levi, what do you think? I think, uh, well, first I want to say to the chat that we, I think when I talk about this book, I probably will reference Light of the Jedi and the High Republic comic spoilers. So if you don't want to read or if you don't want to get that spoiled for you, and you want to have that experience totally, you know, without any any prior knowledge, I we'll, we'll probably will broach on those books as well. So I just want to put that out there. And yeah, I think the name vessel. I think I think uh, Gray is right. It does fit the character, and that it's sort of it, it invokes what is within the ship is what makes the ship. You know, it's a vessel. It contains things, and so I didn't think it was lazy necessarily, but I, I think that was fun. And I think Leox actually is. Um, out of the crew of the vessel, I think there's a wide range of, of characters who I connected with. But I think Leox is, is my favorite of the bunch. I really enjoyed his um, his sentiment throughout the throughout the novel. He has some really really interesting scenes. That I'm sure we'll talk about. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, so Hydra, I'll give you a chance. Uh, what do you think about the vessel and Leox? I found that, as the other two said, it was very um, it very it very much fits um, Leox, but also in a galaxy as large as Star Wars, we get so many weird ship names that are just out there. But a ship being called the vessel or starship or something very similar, that's brand new, and it's clearly very strange, and it suits the world, and it's I quite enjoyed it overall. It was such a fun little detail to throw in. Yeah, I you know I, it didn't bother me, and I started seeing some of the feedback of it. 
uh, Lee Ox is asexual and uh, a bit of a Han Solo ripoff and that uh, the vessel is the lazy uh, name for the ship. And uh, so I went back and I read the novel the second time through, I'm more sensitive to some of these kind of uh, uh, discussions. And it really didn't bother me as I read through it. And I didn't see Lee Ox as as an asexual Han Solo ripoff, he's different. And I, th I like Gray's uh, <laughs> the description, a hippy dippy uh, kind of. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 here we go. Yeah, Reefer Man, he liked that too. Uh, right, he's he, he's uh, a throwback to the seventies kind of guy, which uh, is sort of relevant as well because we had pet rocks in the seventies. Now I don't know. <laughs> How many of you were around in the 70s and had a pet rock? But I did. <laughs> I had one in the 80s, so. <laughs> I was told about it. I was told about it. And uh, on the point of uh, Leox, when I was reading, I believe Claudia De Claudia Gray herself described him as uh, a Matthew McConaughey-esque character. And oh. so the whole time I imagined that. And I, that Maybe. helped with, 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 the, with the reading. And I almost always, despite having uh, a you know, a visual representation of him. I just imagined Matthew McConaughey and it made, I think it made the scenes he was in more, he, that much more enjoyable. And I think taking that knowledge into reading it, it helped a lot. That's a good um, one. And I thought that, you know, um, Affie being a young girl and that they pointed out that Leox is not sexual, which makes you asexual. So I really, and that would mean that a mother would trust their daughter in his, uh, vicinity much more so that honestly didn't bother me at all I mean just pointing out that that's not something he cares about and it was a very small statement I, I didn't yeah. think uh, messed up the book at all I thought it actually pointed to why Affie was actually a young girl on the vessel yeah to Grace to Grace point it because I understand a lot of those criticisms and people don't like being preached to when they you know in, engage in, in media but it didn't come up literally at all towards the book in the book. And when it did, it only served the story and the character. So I, I, I think it, I think it worked rather well. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, and oh, what do you think Hydra? We don't want to make sure we get your thoughts. Um, I found the, the dynamic between Affie and Geo, sorry, not Affie and Geo, Affie, Affie and Leox is quite interesting. And then it all, it all fit for me. Like Leox, like, as was mentioned, like we would we would warn ahead of time what sort of character he would be, and the quote from the book is Master Yoda on Spice, which Claudia Gray mentioned beforehand, which I was like, Yeah, that's basically true, that's correct. Um, and yeah, the Matthew McConaughey stuff, it all was like telegraphed ahead of time, and I found the character to be very um strange and interesting. And also just interesting from some of his perspectives because they he doesn't know anything about the Jedi, yet he considers he believes in like this worldly energy about the galaxy and universe. He sounds kind of crazy talking about it. But that's someone else's viewpoint, and the Jedi to him look kind of crazy. And he calls them, he uses the term for what they use, like black magic. And then Orla says, it's light magic. Light magic. Whatever. And then that's it. So that, that's his viewpoint. And by showing him as the sort of hippy dippy, very different sort of character, it gives us a perspective that's different from the Jedi in terms of the same cosmic sort of existence that even they are kind of put off by, but they come to enjoy overall. Really good, really, really good. Uh, and uh, I want to go back to the relationship between Affy and Leox uh, because uh, Affy is very young. She's a teenager, right? Seventeen. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, seventeen. So um, you're going to send a seventeen-year-old off on a vessel <laughs> uh, to, uh, throughout the galaxy. They're trading uh, uh, items, and we find out that one of the things that they're carrying, kind of stowing away, is spice. Uh, it's a particular kind of spice. We learned later that it, uh, it has certain medicinal properties that are very common in uh, Star Wars later, right? Uh, there, uh, so it, it's Bacta, right? They're carrying Bacta before it was actually uh, widely known as uh, what it what it is. So, um, so uh, Affy, you're sitting off a, a 17 year old girl with a, a, a bit of a hippie. Um, pilot it does give you a sense of uh safety that uh, she's not going to be um molested or or taken assaulted. advantage right assaulted right so i think that's all very important 
And Affy's a very likable character. And, and uh, as you mentioned with uh, Geode, as, as Hydra mentioned with Geode, Affy also uh, doesn't really understand about these Jedi. Uh, are you monks? What's what's the deal? <laughs> like, what's, what's, what is it with you guys? And so she's curious and she asks all kinds of questions and it kind of made the rounds on the internet because uh, uh, she she gets blunt and says that. So that means you can't have sex, right? <laughs> and so, the, so of course, uh, 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 they have to answer. Well, I mean, there are nuances. Um, <laughs> we could have sex, but yeah, probably not, right? <laughs> and on that point, I think that's uh, one of the key elements of this era so far is showing how different the Jedi are now versus how they are in, in the prequels. And so I think there is a lot of, we'll get into it. A lot of the Jedi characters in this book have problems with the Order, and they're all evoke qualities of Qui-Gon in, in The Phantom Menace, I think, and it's pretty explicit in in, in that way. Uh, but, yeah, I don't... Uh, <laughs> I must admit, I lost my train of thought, but yeah, it was just... A, that was a funny moment, but personally, if we're talking about Affy, yeah. uh, I didn't I didn't connect as much with Affy as a character. I thought that... And I think I think because I, I see how you've, you've structured this layout, but in terms of the structure of the book, I thought it wait it felt more if the if the light of the Jedi was a movie, and it, like if the light of the Jedi was Indiana Jones, then this was like young Indiana Jones, the TV show. The way like the the contrast, like it felt like there was a lot packed in here, a lot of great characters that I really liked, but the plot itself, it it was it was formatted a little bit weird for me, and the way they went to the station, came back, and some of the things I felt could have been condensed in a different way, but uh, yeah, I did really like the characters and appreciated what. Uh, Claudia Gray had to say for them. And I think especially towards the end when Affie has to confront her foster mother, I enjoyed that. But throughout the novel, I didn't connect with her specifically as much. Yeah. We, we need to address the Ahsoka in the room. Yeah. <laughs> Gray is showing many off that, yeah. yeah, she's showing off that beautiful statue there on her desk. Uh, the uh, birthday gift she got. Uh, it's absolutely stunning. It's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> so thanks for that. Uh, yeah, so um, for me, it was it's kind of opposite. So you mentioned how you you really liked uh, Leox's character. Uh, for me, he was just sort of there. But uh, I really, <laughs> I, I can really see the exact yeah, it's total flip. That's funny. It is yeah. exactly opposite. Uh, uh, Hydra, what are your thoughts about uh, uh, Affy? Well, I'll be I'll, I'll be frank right up. I'm Caucasian, but her as a character who is ethnically coded black. Um, going on a storyline about how she was trying to free essentially enslaved individuals from her own foster mother like mm -hmm. character was very was very interesting to me also to learn about how smuggling operates in during this era and it's kind of the same thing overall in, in the galaxy but learning this station has been used so much and at any point there's been something going wrong but only this time was something different and then she learns that horrible truth about her own background which she didn't realize and all of that leading to the weird part about this is that her character was very important, but at the end of the day, I feel like she was guided to what, what happened by the force because it's weird to consider that legacy run causing the great disaster within like a week or two, the company itself also collapses because of what happens and what's discovered by the Republic. And her actually doing that essentially changed the course of everything that happened that's gonna go forward because this company was supposed to be on the cutting edge, like the, the book they talk about how many, how the disaster has put them on the map, and then just takes them out of the equation entirely and just kills possible like possibilities for the future. And so her role in that is quite fascinating to me, especially because yes, she has the foster mother character. And it was interesting to watch their interactions when she got to Coruscant, because the woman did seem to care for her, but she had a very much more calculating viewpoint about like human life and like how things work. Very cold. Yeah. 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 The thing is that we don't know anything about her species at all. She's like a we do actually. Creature. Sorry, sorry to sorry to butt in there. No, we, we do. Actually, the bivalves have been in yeah. quite a bit, and they're very I'm logical and calculating as a species. Yeah. I, 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 admittedly, I had to look it up, but the bivalve is the same species as the sci if you guys remember the scientist in the Zillow Beast arc. Ooh, they, they kind of they, she kind of looks like a ricotta, but like that sort of species. Right. Um, right. And so that cold natured, like uh, that matched with me. And after I had seen one other character of her species, I was able to read uh, Scover's character a lot easier. But so, yeah, sorry, okay. continue your point. No, that's okay. Let me loop in everybody real quick. So uh, this the the vessel 
is is part of the burn guild or buying guild B buying guild, guild yeah. buying guild right it's part of the buying guild the buying guild they they do uh they actually take uh, uh pilots and crew in as uh servants right they go into uh, servitude and uh and affy learns that her parents were part of this servitude in the buying guild and they died uh, doing things that were less than above board, right? And then she is adopted by the leader of the buying guild, the 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 head of it, and she's raised by this uh, this this leader. What's her name? Scover. Scover. Scover Vine, and she also is being uh, groomed to take over the buying guild as well. So she's she has access to luxury. And, and as uh, Hydra was mentioning, when she goes to Coruscant, she is in the, the richest of the rich uh, residences that you could be in, right? So uh, uh, please continue, Hydra. You were making an absolutely fantastic point. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, Hydra? Yeah, Hydra? We lost him. <laughs> we've lost him. Um, we lost Hydra. You were oh, saying Santa. Oh, I'm, I'm here. Sorry, I was muted. That's when I was. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Please, please continue. You were making some brilliant points. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so I'll finish up just with Affy. And so her storyline with that was very fascinating and her getting involved in smuggling and then also freeing these individuals from their bondage. And it'll be interesting to see where she goes forward from this because now she, at the very end of the story, she has now made the owner of the vessel and is technically. Lent, um, uh, his boss, sorry, yeah, is it his boss? And she will be the one to help him chart a new course forward as this new path opens up to her after she's made this major choice. And we know from the reveals for the next wave of High Republic stuff that they're going back out into the fringe of the galaxy in some crazy mission. So that'll be very interesting to see how she progresses or how has she has she, how she has progressed since the time we last saw her at the very end of this major decision that changed her own life. I believe I believe they'll be appearing in these High Republic Adventures comic run. Am I correct in that? I believe they I interact believe, with. Yes, but they're also I believe they're supposed to show up in the main um, the main series because they're going the to run. the place with um, Reese Nellis and the others. I believe on the young adult one again. Uh, yes, so was, um, yeah, out of the shadows. Yes. Uh, San and Santa was saying something. I think, and I had been an excellent point. And I do. I think her character at the end, she has a realization that. If she can wait and become the leader of the guild, then she can free everybody. But she can wait; they can't afford to, and so she makes this decision to turn Scover in. Um, but a, a point that Santa was making uh, about her parents—I think like, one of the key things that he left out was that her parents were making that risky action to try and uh, end their sentence. You know, they were incentivized to end their sentence so they could spend time with their daughter, and then they died. In that, and that, and that, all this comes out in the later half of the book, and I, I and I'll, I'll say this again later. I really enjoyed the, particularly the last hundred pages of this book. I just felt the, the first half was a little bit slow and, and I think a little bit muddied, but the end I think was particularly salient, especially with Affy's character. Yeah, I'll agree with you on the pacing. The, the second time through, the first time I, I, I bogged down in the middle, and I thought, well, maybe it was just me. And the second time I bogged down worse. <laughs> It was even slower for me the second time through. Uh, but then the last, the last, so if you put it in acts, right? First, second, third act. The last act of the book uh, is is great. It moves yeah, right along. Really good content. Really good content. And I, I think a, a lot of why I had maybe some of those pacing issues is because I had a lot of preconceived notions already going in. Because as soon as this book hit, there was this whole, there was a whole controversy over Geode, which I'm sure we're going to get into. And then there was the official knowledge that there was the Dren gear were being introduced in this book, which is something we'll get to later. And so yeah. going in expecting not only a huge geode presence, but also a large Dren gear presence, it was, you know, I was sort of on the edge of my seat. And so the, the main plot of the book is they're on the station at two separate points. And I was the whole, on the first time I was really surprised when they left. And I was like, well, where, where's this going now? I thought, you know, I thought that this was something was going to happen on the station. And, and so it was that a lot of that I think had to do with my own preconceived notions about the story heading into it. I don't think there was anything inherently wrong with the way Claudia Gray wrote it, but I, I, I do think there are some um, structural issues I have. 
yeah. when I when I find it when I start it starts to drag and I kind of am losing focus I just turn it up to 150 times and so the the voices speed up and honestly on an eight hour book down to a five hour book sped up there's no time for any lull you know it, it, it just goes and and I have to say I didn't find any lulls in the story I did get to lose my interest a little bit when it kept going back 25 years ago and kept telling that story um I actually even like printed all that off to look at because I it kept like just going out of my brain because it just didn't hold my interest besides that I I stayed very interested in the entire book for if a only second hero and third. Fire, if only yeah so let me bring up the controversy with geode uh, and, and uh, for those that aren't aware, Geode is the navigator. Uh, so uh, the whole time I was reading the book, uh, and, and somebody brought up, I think, on Star Wars Only's uh, Discord, that a Geode, if you just Google Geode, not High Republic Star Wars Geode, just a Geode, uh, it, it it's a rock that has minerals inside, right? So when you break it open, there's a cavity inside that has different minerals. And uh, so the whole time they were reading the book, they were expecting that geode was actually a, a, a vehicle for transporting things hidden, right? So you could put spice or whatever in there and nobody would know because it's inside this rock, right? And uh, the whole time I read in the book, the first time through, I'm thinking, well, it's a joke, right? Because they are just uh, anthropomorphizing, right? They're putting human qualities on an object or, or uh uh, creature. They do state that it's a joke when they say, oh, he's a wild man. They actually, at one point she says that, am I in on the joke about Geode? So yeah. he is sentient, but all the stuff that they say he does is an actual joke. Yeah. Well, and it's all anthropomorphized. So you'd like a, a big event would happen and they'd say in uh, Geode looks stoic. You're like, yeah, it's, that's, it's, that, that was the way it was written made me laugh. And okay. and he had to recrystallize in his room. I thought that was kind of funny. So what is he doing to not be crystallized? I found Geo <laughs> to be hilarious. Um, being mad that he isn't a vessel for storing uh, stuff, which was never even implied. I think you're setting yourself up just to be mad, you know, yeah. at that point. I, and I, you know, I get it. I understand that people say it like Hawks Holocron, right? It's a, it's a, not a creative name for a rock. I mean, it literally is a rock. A geode is a rock. Uh, so um, I get where the criticism comes from that maybe it lacks some creativity, but I, I like you, I thought it was hilarious. Uh, Hydra, I, what did you think of geode? The geode, like as a, as a name, they, they tell us that his name cannot be spoken by someone who has a mouth, which indicates that the name that he has is something they gave him. So giving him the name geode as just a rock would make sense because they are all human and he's a rock to them. But I found it very interesting as they went through because very close to the end, in the last hundred pages, as I was mentioned before, it gets really intense. He has some actual very major um, characterization that suddenly pops up from his perspective, which we haven't, we haven't actually seen. And then he actually leaves the ship, and that basically fully like kills the whole idea that he's actually a joke, or he's just sitting there. Right. And in the very end of the, close to the very end of the book, Ruth Silas, who's the um, young Padawan character, he hits Geo, and, he, and Geo saves him. But then he feels in the Force all these like different facets and emotions from Geo, and he suddenly he kind of like cries a little bit. He's like he feels this, and because if Geo has all these crystals inside of him. I always, I kind of view him as this sort of very force sensitive race because he's plugging in navigation coordinates or whatever for them. And he seems to have all this inner emotion because um, Orena, um, Orla Jereni also notices that he has a lot of facets inside of him and she communicates with him very simply. And then of course, there's also some very hilarious stuff about like, oh, he's gone out clubbing when they reach Coruscant. And then I have expected them to jump to cut to just him sitting on a chair in a club with all the lights strobing and him just sitting there on a, on a chair. but. I found him very, I found him very enjoyable and very interesting. And I mean, about the controversy about him being a rock, we have had there were there are much more insane things in legends. There was a literal sentient crying mountain, and people are annoyed that this rock doesn't have that. That was in canon too. I <laughs> that that part when a uh, reef was saved it's, it's by Geode kind of. is like my second favorite part of the book. And when he realized the how 
in the force with Geode. That was, I loved that part. Yeah, <laughs> this part with Zemo, yeah. That's funny, Reefer Man. Yeah, yeah there you go. Uh, that Reefer Man, uh, that's a good one. Uh, Geo fist bumping with with Zemo. There you go. But uh, yeah, I thought, again, I thought that it was you're reading through. You never see Geo do anything. He's just there. And then they they push these uh, anthropomorph anthropomorphized uh, characteristics to it. And then he looks stoic. He's serious. He was quiet, introspective. Like all these things. You're like. He's a rock. He's just sitting there, uh, and and but it, it's absolutely believable up until the end, and he he saves the day, right? Geode actually saves the day um, for Wraith, and we'll talk about Wraith in a, in just a moment. But uh, and then you learn that he is an actual sentient being, and it's not just a, a rock; it's it is a being. And I yeah, I don't know. I can understand why that's landed with people in a in a funny way. Um, I think if you read the book, it like he's not he's not like in it all that much. Uh, when you compare, yes, he does save the day, but he's not like he's not taking up full chapters. You know, you're never reading. But but yeah, I, it was it was it was it presented humor for most of it. But I think Claudia Gray's ultimate because uh, she often you know writing Master and Apprentice and then this, she's often writing commentary on the way we view the Force. And I think you know from Yoda and Empire Strikes Back, you know through the trees, the rock, the ship. You know, I, I think it evokes that sort of, you know, the force is in everything and it's not, I, I, well, I agree that the character of Geode in Conception is rather silly and it's fun, but I don't, it doesn't detract from the other, you know, the theme of it and the rest of my, what I could enjoy from the novel. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I really like it. And, I, and again, reading it the second time through, I was extra sensitive to it and it was funnier the second time than it was the first time. Because uh, you know you're in on the joke, and it was great. Yeah, oh, yeah. And I, while we're talking about, it, I just want to clear it up because there's a lot of misconception that he's like a Jedi or swinging lightsabers, and that's not the case. It's he like he's mostly a background, as we've said, a, a joke-like character who is revealed to have more, you know, connection to the Force than he's a, a Vincian, as it's revealed. A Vincian. I thought he was fun. I thought it was, yeah, I thought, I think it was goofy. I, I admit, you know, I think it was goofy, but I, I don't, I don't take issue, too much issue with it, but there's no, like, he isn't a Jedi as it has maybe been implied by, by a few. That's true. And he's not a pilot. He's not a Jedi. No. Uh, and, and he's a navigator. And the question is like on any other Star Wars vessel, have you seen a navigator? Uh, L2. From L3, Solo, seven, yeah. yeah, L3, she's, L3 a, she's a navigator. Yeah, but she, but it's a robot, right? And then, and, and eventually that, that sentience is brought into uh, the, Falcon. the Falcon itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've never seen like a, a, a character as a, as a navigator outside of a, of a droid, right? Yeah. You've, got, you've got astromech droids, you've got, you know, those kind of things. But to see a person or a character, Geo, as a as a navigator is also unique. I thought. Now we have we have seen one navigator before. There are, of course, there's back there's a bunch of background characters because in the Clone Wars, thousands of clones doing the job on the bridge or whatever. But there's also the character I believe. Oh, it, Thrawn. I, mean, I believe. Oh shit. Oh, here we go. Ray Sloan, I think, was a navigator when she was much younger because there's an entire short story about how she was involved with this navigation calculation with Darth Vader on board and Darth Sidious. And then she noticed an error that had occurred and prevented them from flying into a star. So that was a navigator that I remembered thinking about that. And I was like, that's impressive. But yes, also droids and stuff like that. Mostly they have been non sentient from what we And know. the Skywalkers from this the Thrawn, Thrawn trilogy. Yeah, the trilogy yes. use the Force. They're, they're uh, navigators as well. Yeah, I, I think we've seen navigators before, but I think that the Santa is right. This is this is unique in what it's presenting as far as yeah. And, and Ducky, Ducky, uh, your question is is right. It, it's a hundred percent a big rectangle. Yes, it is. Uh, it, it it doesn't sprout legs. It doesn't have uh, arms. It we never, don't know though. It, I, Leox references that he molts sometimes, and I'm still he ready has for to recrystallize. So maybe maybe there's a reveal. Stopped? Yeah, maybe there's a reveal that he is like a sort of. A being, and that he's just sort of in this form right now, and that he actually later will become a, you know, a more 
humanoid being, and I think that could be funny and fun because we've but, seen but, other rock species in Star Wars. It could be like a crystalline being. Well, so uh, for for Cusela Lopez uh, asked a really good question: Is there a Kyber connection with Geode? That's a great question. Might Geode uh, house inside, like when you look at a, a, a rock that has these crystals inside? Might Geode uh, have Kyber? What do you think? I say I yes. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I don't think so, personally, because if that was the case, wouldn't the Jedi immediately sense it? Because in what we've been seeing in Rebels and other stories, that Kyber Crystals has an immediate impact on the Jedi. They can hear it calling to them in the Force. It seems. Here, they have a very difficult time connecting with him until a certain point. And after they've emotionally connected with him and they discover his inner complexity, that's when they like connect with him as a person and understand his mentality. But up until that point, they seem to be very unaware of what he has been long beyond a joke. Like we Silas, yes, is dealing with grief and others are dealing with grief. But even so, they would have been a mention of at least like a song or like a hum of some sort in their minds perhaps, but I don't know. That's my perhaps, But I, I also think like when we see the younglings go to uh, get their kyber crystal to build their lightsaber, there's only one crystal that calls out to them. Even though there's, you know, hundreds or whatever, there's one that calls to them. So. Perhaps there could be uh, one in there. I think it's possible. Uh, and and Robin asked, does he move? Grace says yes. Well, you never see him like, you know, saunter or walk or or shuffle or roll or you know, scooch. He's uh, just moved. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, there's He's an just, implication of movement. Yeah, there's an implication. We don't know how he gets from point A to point B. Um, levitate. We don't know. But on that, on that point about Kyber, you know, in the realm of the Force, I think it does have some connectivity because the Kyber is a crystal that has Force within it and it has its own, it's alive in a sort of way, right? And so I think that Geode also being something that's either crystalline or, you know, rock-like and having the same similar amount of Force, I don't know, once again, I think it ties back to that Yoda quote. I think all of these things do have the Force within them ultimately. I think a Kyber crystal has more, but I think that they connect in at least concept in the way that they are. Uh, it, and Ducky, was, I wasn't a fan of space whales either, right? It, it took yeah. a little while. I, I love I, the purgle. <laughs> uh, I, I thought they did a really good job of, it, of uh, the purgle in Lost in Space uh, across the, you know, the if, you've, if you've seen that thing. Anyway, they're space whales. Um, <laughs> so um, anything else on Geo before we move on to some other characters and, uh, and continue? I want to uh, take uh, folks to, uh, and so one of the complaints about uh, uh, the the first novel is there's so many characters. And this one, they're, they're quite contained. You have just a, a handful. And the first real crossover one that's in Light of the Jedi is Jora Mali. Uh, it opens with a scene of Jora and Wraith um, on Coruscant. And um, we already know from light of the Jedi that Jorah's dead, right? Yeah, she dies. So when you open, it's a little odd to uh, come into this, starting with Jorah and Wraith on this little uh, escapade on Coruscant, knowing that she's already dead. Um, and then De and then you were introduced in a, in a little while to Dez, who is also was a student of Jorah's, uh, but is now a Jedi Knight, and she's taken on a new Padawan and Wraith. So Dez went before a bit of a master um, lightsaber dude, right? Known for he's, lightsaber skills? I think he's yeah. more he's known for his adventuring attitude, I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and being to able to, to oh. battle with his lightsaber. He is known for that yeah. because they pointed out that Wraith was an archivist and then he was you know not <laughs> yeah yeah uh so and and rj i i'm i'm ignoring your question for the moment we'll come back to that later we kind of addressed it up front but we'll come back uh i, I know there's questions about levi uh from from uh the, the star star wars uh theory uh, uh nerd theory cast last night uh we, we don't want to interrupt this we'll come back to it later so, uh, and, and if, if you feel like it, uh, uh, 
Levi, you can just uh, respond in the text, but that's up to you. Um, yeah, so, I, don't, I don't have the chat pulled up, quite honestly. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've got uh, these characters, and we know that uh, they're on their way. Like like uh, you mentioned, Des is a bit of an adventurer, um, and Wraith wants to stay on Coruscant. Jora has agreed to take uh, control of the the new station. It's going to take Wraith with him with her, but uh, he doesn't want to go. She dies, and he's thinking, "Well, I might get out of this whole trip anyway because I could get another Jedi Master that's going to keep me here." Right. So that's that's what happens uh, at the beginning, and then uh, the the Wraith and Dez end up. Uh, on the vessel, being transported to presumably the Starlight Beacon, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's when all things go sideways. Yeah, I, yeah, and I, I had asked Santa to put uh, Jorah Mali on this list because of her, despite not being in the book, uh, you know, save for the prologue, she has a profound impact on both you know, Des and Wreath and a lot of the characters. And I think she has some of the most powerful quotes in the book. And Claudia Gray has come the, she writes really good force quotes these days, you know, in Master and Apprentice, you know, choosing the light because it's there. And she has a similar one. Jora Malley espouses a similar view that when you're conflicted and you're, you know, you can't center yourself, at least try and lean to the light that's towards the end. And it, in all of these tense moments with the Jedi characters, Jora Malley's advice and influence is able to impact them in a positive way. And so I thought it was worth uh, mentioning her because she does have that impact on, on the book. Yeah. Hydra, we haven't heard from you in a bit. What do you think? I think her character in the no in the novel, yes, she does have definitely a larger impact because both of her Padawans, one, one former, one current, appear in the story and they both sort of reveal how she both took them and tried to like mold them into like bringing more out of themselves, like the, the better qualities. And she kind of failed with both of them in some respects that she didn't get quite get it right because Dez is super adventure hungry and he constantly goes wherever he wants to find adventure versus following like the force or like doing something that's like quote unquote right overall. And then Wreath is just a super um, uh, isolated, wants to stay in Coruscant, not go anywhere else because he really likes Coruscant, it's super urban sprawl. And then she makes his choice to go out there and for basically forces him to come with her because she wants probably a second time to do something better with that. And unfortunately, uh, yeah, she does die, and then that has a massive impact on this, what the story goes up. Basically going from Acts 2 in the mid middle of it as then. It, it really does. And now I, I want to bring up, because you just mentioned about Rafe, um, he, and, and let me just bring up the next slide here too. There's two other characters that they run into on the vessel, and it's Orla and Comac. Well, Comac is a bit of a, 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 a hero in uh, in the eyes of Wraith, because Wraith is an academic, right? He's more interested in uh, staying in the library, uh, learning, reading, uh, and Comac uh, is, uh, did I say his name right? Comac? Yes, Comac. Yeah, uh, is, is an author. Uh, he's, he's, he's a well-known uh, author of all kinds of uh, histories of different species and such. So, yeah, Wraith really wants to stay there, uh, and he'd be perfectly happy staying in the library. And that's what uh, you know his his uh, Jedi Master was trying to give him the other part. Like, you need to get out, right? And I think to Hydra's point that she may have failed, but at least even if she didn't live to see it, they both, you know, sort of rectify that path by the end. And her teachings influence both of them to where uh, Des takes the Barash Vow, which is first introduced, I believe, in Charles Soule's Darth Vader 2017 comic run. Uh, and it's where like a Jedi essentially just goes out and meditates for, it could be decades on end, just to find themselves and be one with the Force. And so, you know, Des, this adventure, ends up doing that, and then Wreath eventually comes to terms with going out to the frontier. And so, ultimately, you know, despite, yes, yeah, she may have had those failings, her teachings were strong enough to impact them to change their decisions even after after her, she was gone. So, yeah. yeah. And eventually, Reef asks Comac to be his um, yeah. teacher. Yeah. 
and, and oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, interestingly enough, you would think that maybe they would go back and do more writing uh, and, and spin in the library, but but that's not the case. Comac would take them out, and Comac realized that he needs to kind of stretch himself as well. Um, and I, I, I want to go ahead and bring up the next slide because it, it's kind of tough to break these up. Um, you've got Orla, who's a Jedi way seeker. We learned that's somebody like uh, the best I think most people be familiar with is uh, Ahsoka, right? Yeah. She, she left the Jedi Council, but she's still uh, adhering to Jedi uh, principles. Yeah. yeah, principles. Um, and that's Orla, but at this time in the uh, in in the history of the Jedi Count Order, they allowed it. They actually uh, had a name for it. They're way seekers, and they they stayed in contact with these people. They helped them along the way. They communicated with them. That they, they were just another type of Jedi that weren't following the the typical route. Uh, I find that uh, really fascinating when when we look at that in, with the perspective of Ahsoka. And then, uh, and I loved Orla. I loved her character. Um, the dual white lightsabers weren't lost on me. <laughs> that she's a white, uh, uh, that she's a way seeker wasn't lost on me. Uh, so uh, her, the, the parallels between her and Ahsoka, I felt were, were pretty strong. So uh, that's that's my thought on them. Let's uh, makes you makes you wonder what happens in between the High Republic and the current Star Wars. That the Jedi go from having all different versions, like there's the Way Seekers and all these different things, to just being the staunch sticklers that they ended up being later. And I bet you anything, it's all Yoda. Something happens now. Yoda dislikes all the leniency, and then eventually he's going to rein everybody in and make the Jedi what they are later. I think and, that, and he basically ruins them. Yoda <laughs> ruins the Jedi. <laughs> I don't know if um, it'll be Yoda specifically. I think it'll be more of a slow diplomatic ruining, if you would. But uh, I think that's one of the yeah most interesting things about this era is. Uh, and well, he's some... the one that carries over all the rules. Like he's not. Yeah. You know, he's not the biggest wig right now, and then eventually he's the main leader. So I would Ultimately, imagine. Yes. I, I, think I personally think on he's going to yeah. be the one that tightens up all the reins. I think something's going to happen to make him go, "Oh, this isn't okay." Yeah, yeah. Hydra, Hydra, what were you thinking? I don't know if it'll be Yoda. I think it'll be the Republic that'll change underneath the Jedi. And we'll force That's what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah, because we've been getting this, like even in line of the Jedi, we get this literal hint from the character from Sereno, this like this noble person who's kind of um, stuffy a little bit, and he doesn't like what um, the restrictions and like uh, like how long they're lasting. But he's being prodded by his assistant, who we know is a spy for the Nile, unfortunately. And it's like, will he actually become the next chancellor and do something drastic to change how things work? Or will something else, after all this chaos and disaster with possibly involving the Jedi, they'll be like, no, you need to follow our rules as the Republic. You must stay in line. And the Jedi will be like, fine. Yeah. Yes. We don't know. But that's so super, like, that's basically where my mind just goes. But it's probably going to be something much more complicated or much more simpler or just something totally different. I'm in com complete agreement. I think that whatever happens in this era is going to tie the Jedi and the Republic closer together so that when Palpatine is Chancellor, that he's able to exert pressure on the Jedi much easier than he would in this, in this period of time where the Jedi are very much independent, uh, you know, peacekeepers. And in the, you know, obviously in the clone wars, they're generals and war makers. And it's, I, they, but they, they didn't to, become generals and war makers until the clone Wars started. So, I mean, that's not what they were generally moving towards. The clone Wars started and they issued them to be generals. I think, I think that they have to get to a point where they're even willing to make that decision, seeing them here, I really think is a starch contrast from prequel Jedi. They are very, very different. And if I if I may finish the, what I wanted to say was the, this is spoilers for maybe the whole era and for Dooku Jedi Lost. But in the book Dooku Jedi Lost, which is about how Dooku fell from the Jedi, he is looking at one of the members of the Lost Twenty, which is from a deleted scene in Attack of the Clones, and it's like these busts in the Jedi archives of all the Jedi Masters who left the Order, and one of them is. A person called Master Trennis. And Trennis, Keith Trennis is currently the main character in the Star Wars High Republic comic run. And so if our main character of this, you know, one of these this facets of the High Republic 
it gets so disillusioned that she feels she has to leave the order. I think we're, you know, we're going to see something pretty extreme that's going to alter the Jedi. And I think we get that in the end of Light of the Jedi. There's, you know, Elzar Man has a vision and he's like, something bad's going to happen and it's going to ruin us. And so I don't know if it's going to be from within. I think there's going to be a lot of moving parts that make this, you know, puzzle, co puzzle come together. Yeah, so a, a couple points real quick. Uh, End of Light of the Jedi, you also see where, and I can't remember who the uh, captain of that Jedi vessel that went into the, the war or that battle. The uh, Ataraxia is the name of the ship. Yeah, yeah the Ataraxia, the, the, the captain of that, that Jedi, she uh, was a female, right? Oh, she, Avar Chris, is that who you're talking about? Was it Avar that led I believe, that? I believe so. I'm trying to remember. Jora uh, and Avar were both there at the Battle of Nur, and Jora okay. dies, and yeah, okay, I, th I think it's Avar. Mm, I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure, but in, in any event, uh, they, the, the, the Jedi Council's deciding should we send the ship or not, and it's the captain who says um, that they decide will this um, bring more light to the universe or more dark, right? And so they decide to go because. Um, they decided, yes, it would bring more light. Uh, and so uh, they were really um, struggling with should the Jedi be that intertwined in a battle with uh, something that the Republic is, is involved in? What does the, what did the Jedi have to do with this? Um, and, and by the time we get to the, the prequels and uh, the Clone Wars, of course, they're, they're generals and they're, they're leaders and they're right there. So yeah, where I, it's going to be exciting to see how it transpires. Uh, you, you both touched on some really, really uh, key things, right? So, um, um, what else? I, I do want to say. So they're on their way to the Starlight Beacon, right? Uh, and on that, they uh, the the big event happens, right? The the ship breaks up, and uh, Hydra brought it up earlier. This ship that broke up was another one of the Bind Guild's vehicles. The Legacy Run. Yeah, the Legacy yeah. Run was a Bind Guild uh, uh, ship. And uh, in, in fact, so much that Affy wondered if her parent, parental figure, right, uh, uh, the, the leader Scover. of the Scover. Yeah, Scover. Scover was on it. It's such a premier uh, vehicle. And, uh, and is a bit relieved that Scover's not on it. Um, so the, the, uh, that, that event happens, they get knocked out of hyperspace and they happen to come by uh, a place that um, is, is like empty space. It was programmed into the vessel's coordinates and they drop out of hyperspace at this, in this system and they, they, and this kind of goes back to what Gray was talking about, where we skip back in time. It's the first time this really happens. They, they drop in there and they hear this beacon. Uh, I, we need help or something to that effect. And they realize that they, that uh, Orla and Comac. And so I have them grouped together on this slide for this reason. Orla and Comac, when they were younger, were on another mission that had a lot of the same points in it that we see here. And they learn that what we learn is the lessons they learned in that previous mission apply here. And uh, so they hear this distress signal, wait a minute, before we respond, it could be a way to attack us. We need to get more information. And so you get this back and forth. We go back in time, you see Orla and Comac in the past, and then they come present in Orla or Comac or both of the give advice to the crew. Let's do this. Right. And, and so it's very much lessons learned kind of thing being applied. And they find this other, um, other vehicle. So who wants to uh, introduce us to this other vehicle and the, and the characters on that? Well, I, I before you went further there, I wanted to say that Gray earlier had talked about how those flashback sequences were something that you felt slowed down. Uh, you know the, the the plot. I was actually most excited by those. I thought those oh, were really, okay. yeah. I thought those were really fun. I thought seeing the Jedi on a you know a mission in that time and the 
and the backdrop of the huts and these crime syndicates and the interplanetary disputes and eventually sort of the re reveal at the end is that it was all sort of a, a play by the huts that ultimately you it bears fruit in the new high republic run the huts do emerge and are like all right time to claim this so essentially to est establish um for people who don't know if you're if you're if you're this far in and you don't know so there are two planets that are you know sort of like sister planets but they don't talk to each other they're they don't they don't communicate with each other and their hatred for each other so long just deep seated within the community that they don't even know why but so the the huts hire a lasat named isamir who is like the head of a local crime syndicate to kidnap the rulers of each and hold them for ransom and so that way the jedi can come and then they can kill the Jedi and the Jedi can fail and they can prove even more that this region of space who's always in conflict with each other doesn't need the Republic. Remember, this is you know 200 years before, so the Republic is expanding and they want it sort of so distressed. But at the end, it's revealed that the real, the real goal of the Huts was to wipe out that local crime syndicate and the Jedi to succeed so that they could move in and do whatever they wanted. And so, but, but the resolution of that is, you know, those two, the Isamir, the guy who kidnaps the rulers, actually kidnaps the wrong people and kidnaps one from each planet and while they're hostages they talk and they realize they have more in common than they don't which i think is you know a pretty uh salient theme at this moment and then they're able to you know mend that 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 divide between them and then eventually the starlight beacon is built in that space so this beacon of hope is built in that space between them and so that's the arc and yeah, as was Santa was saying, Orla and um, Comac were on this mission together, and this is where I really enjoyed. And they're trying to save the hostages, and Orla and Comac are both really struggling with the Force, and you know, do I follow the Force? And this is sort of what sets Orla on her path to become more like Ahsoka. Is... And they're Padawans at this point. They're Padawans, they're, yes. They're, they're masters. masters. Lara Sorvel and Simix. Simix is a snake-like, and that is. Yes. Um... Yeah, please take it away. Oh, I would just throw in that so that they could, so that they knew that they were Padawans. I wasn't trying to take over. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 that was great. And, and I thought uh, you raised a really good point there, Levi, that um, the, these, these planets are so set apart from each other, the, the peoples, that they, they uh, despise the people from the other planet and they don't even know why, because they're bad. It goes back to like the Hatfields and McCoys, the, the kind of the old legends here in the States. Uh, and, and things like that, uh, where one one group of people hate another group of people because they're different groups of people. Um, and it is a, a bit uh, pertinent to what we find in our culture today and within the Star Wars community today. We've got these divides where we have a thing that we love, but we can't get along with each other because we come from different camps. Uh, Hydra. What do you do? I enjoyed the um, the stories that were spaced, like the backstory that was spaced in between different chapters because um, at the beginning I was wondering, I mainly, when it started happening, I was wondering, so what's the big picture here beyond just telling us that there was a similarity when they arrived to outside of the Axelman station, which we're going to get to, and then this ancient 25 years, well ancient, 25 years ago mission that they were also on where they arrived and had the stress beacon to reach them. And then, yeah. so at the very end, we do realize there's a lot of thread, a lot of threads that come together that lead to what we've been seeing about the whole thing. But then also, just overall, how it's been informing the story going forward and why they're acting the way they are and how they're um, approaching the situation. And so, I enjoyed the story overall. And yes, like all the details about the um, the huts were also very fun because, uh, well, they're getting very big in the comics, and it's very interesting to see them. Um, it's, it's interesting to see them doing something that's act in a book for once because we've not really seen the huts in any. Um, book capacity in a very long time i think so that was fun for me yeah yeah i i, I enjoy it so they find this other ship this other ship is a, a, a bit of a uh a patchwork this they, is in the the current timeline for right right this so is, we're back is, to current timeline yeah. right we're, we're, we're back they cut the the big event happens uh the vessel gets knocked out of hyperspace in this coordinates that was in the computer and they're in this and they find out that there's this other vehicle they do t touch base with it, and it's it's a patchwork uh, ship, different parts from different things melded together, uh, and they find out there are two people on that ship. Uh, one, uh, the character's name is Nan. Nan is a, a, a diminutive, right, like a petite girl, um, younger, uh, more the age of Affy, 
um, and like teens, uh, apparently, uh, but but petite, very small in size, stature, and Hag. Hag is a Zabrak, which I thought was fascinating. Again, Zabrak, uh, and, um, and older gentleman, walks with a cane, um, is more her caretaker. And uh, they are out there in space, and um, they end up going to this station. And this station, let me bring it up so folks can see, is the Maxine Station. Um, again, folks may have seen this picture before. Um, it shows up in the a, a, a station very much like this one, or perhaps even this one, it where the it, it's the same station. And this, yeah, this image is from, sorry to cut you off, Sam, it's from the Rise of Kylo Ren comic mm -hmm. written by Charles Soule. Yeah, so it's uh, the Maxine station is the same station that, that uh, uh, Kylo is on with um, with uh, Snoke. Snoke. Yeah, Snoke when they were when they were younger, and uh, Snoke is giving Kylo some lessons on this thing. So here we've got a connection from the High Republic to the sequel era. Uh, I thought it was fascinating. This this uh, the ball in the middle is a uh, big terrarium. <laughs> it's it's a biosphere. Uh, lots of uh, plant life, lots of things like that. And then it's got two lower rings and two uh, upper rings that are uh, have docking stations on them. You can kind of see here. Um, all right, they've got these docking stations along the way. And uh, they've got storage. And so they're, they're exploring these rings, trying to figure out what's going on. And that's where they keep finding different markings written on the walls. Uh, uh, different things going on, but they can sense a very dark presence in this uh, in bias biome, right? And they they're, assume that they're statues. Well, they there's see idols these, there. Yeah. Exactly. They see these, what, four idols, right? Yeah, four. And um, they sense that those idols are the source of the dark energy. Um, and um, there's there's some stuff that goes around there, but in the meantime, on the on the way, one of our Jedi disappears. Right, so uh, they're exploring these rings, uh, and um, it's Des right in. Yeah, Des goes into one room while they're exploring another room, and his room turns really bright white, and then boom, he's gone. The assumption is that uh, he was evaporated. That there was some misfunction in the station and just completely evaporated, uh, and and there's a big loss there, uh, and they're, they they continue to explore the station, uh, and and these idols, and the dark presence. Meanwhile, some other folks show up, right? Some some other folks from different uh, clans, different uh, people. And they cause some problems. Yeah. They don't they don't stay around too long, but they they do capture um, Des. No, not Des. They capture Nan. Nan yeah. again, the the petite girl that from the other ship that they found. Uh, they they capture Nan, and uh, uh, Wraith is forced to use his lightsaber, chops off one of their arms, and saves her. And, and that becomes really, really critical because they start to form this relationship with Nan. Nan's asking all kinds of questions about the Jedi as well. And Wraith is more than uh, uh, willing to, to teach her anything he can. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, to summarize it a, a bit more, the, so essentially when the great disaster happens, uh, it's, it's as, if, as if a bunch of people were driving on a highway and then there's like a sudden jut in the highway and everyone goes off the road. So everyone around this station was just sort of thrown out of hyperspace. There's a lot of people who are at odds with each other, but it, could you pull up the image of the, of the station again? Yeah. Yeah. So it, where we see those black vines and stuff, that's actually, we see that happen in the book. That's the vines where, you know, they say it's growing over. And then when Reith invents the Dren gear, they mention how they turn all black and gray. So that's, I think I'm pretty sure that that's the same, like that's oh, okay. like we see that uh, that we see how that happened, um, 
and and to yeah you were talking about a connection to the sequels and I, I i think in in so snoke is using this as a place to teach ben that if there is too much light then it can overgrow and it's just as bad as if there's too much dark but obviously we learn from this book and insight we learn from this book is that that's a lie because what caused this was actually a source of not too much light but really deep darkness and so with the dren gear which is this you know it's really it's dark it's it's the dark side so i thought that was really fascinating that we got an additional insight into the relationship and manipulations of snoke and, and ben from this book into the dark that i i, I like that it illuminated that Snoke was once again just lying and manipulating to Ben about you know the concepts of the Force. So I thought that was and, cool. And I like that they're in the story Bloodline. They talk about the Maxine Warriors a, a whole bunch, and then in this book, you know, two hundred years ago, it's the a Maxine Station, and it, it ends up explaining why they were so powerful and how they got around to become who they were. So I thought that was a cool little tie-in. I've really enjoyed the interconnectedness, like, like seeing these little things. Um, and, and you mentioned before in the flashback scene, um, uh, oh shoot, what's that species that's in uh, Rebels? Um, uh, Lasat. Yeah, Lasat, right? So there's a Lasat. Uh, you, you'd never hear of Lasats until Rebels, but here we have a few hundred years earlier, uh, an, another Lasat involved, uh, and, and maybe on the wrong side of things. But <laughs> There's a Lasat Jedi too. As a Lasat yeah. Jedi, and later in the book, it's really, really cool. So um, uh, the interconnectedness between the the High Republic to uh, the prequel era, we, we've already discussed some of that, to the uh, Bloodlines, which follows right after Return of the Jedi, and uh, into the sequel era, is really, really well thought. Um, Hydra. Yes. Hi. Um, the station is quite fascinating. Quite a fascinating place because of all the things mentioned before, but just the concept of it also, it's very visually striking because that's the point of it. Like they, they recognize it immediately, well, Wraith, Wraith does. But it's also interesting just from a standpoint to consider if any more exist out there or just the only one of its kind that remains in the galaxy and how that will play in the future because the Nile know about it. They arrive at the very end and try to, try to uh, they find exactly what it is and that's possibly a, lang a hanging thread to examine in the future. But yeah, the whole idea, like the great darkness and the statue, like I was very concerned. I was very interested about what was going on. Then again, I, I, I knew it was going to happen because we knew what the Dren gear were and what they were going to be. So I was like, this is not good. So there was a lot of sense of dread constantly about them doing all the things in the station. And then they ultimately remove the idols and leave. And I'm like, oh, good God, we're doomed. <laughs> that, was, that was a very fun. I found the station very tense constantly and just wondering what's going to go right, what's going to go wrong here. And then at a certain point, yes, then Des is uh, incinerated, which is horrible. But then earlier than that, Athi gets horribly poisoned suddenly by one of these plants, which shows shows how lethal some of these creatures are, and then they manage to save her, of course. But right. yeah, on the station overall, very tense place, especially also because of the massive fight that breaks out soon into the beginning, because all these different people from outside of the Republic get stuck there and suddenly start fighting over supplies, and the Jedi have to use shock and awe to subdue them into obeying and helping each other out. Yeah, the really good action scene in there, right? I liked it. Uh, and then you, you raise a good point. I'll let you uh, address it. But so. Uh, the, apparently, the uh, the the big event is uh, the the hyperspace event is resolved, and they're allowed to go back to uh, continue their journey. First of all, they kicked off all the troublemakers, and it's just the, the these two crew, and they're allowed to continue their journey. So uh, they all board the vessel and go back to Coruscant. And uh, this is when Affy decides she has to call out uh, the, the her her mother, right. The, the mother figure that she's been mm -hmm. raped with and uh, and put it into her uh, whole uh, ordeal. And um, they take these statues back. So tell us about uh, returning these statues. I really enjoyed the statue being returned because it was very interesting just to see them. Like they, they were constantly described, it's very fascinating. We do have an image of them now thanks to the comics. But it's also interesting to see what they get taken because they take these four statues off the station after they surround them with a binding ritual to make sure the darkness inside of them, quote unquote, stays inside. They transport them back and then they return to the Coruscant and then they take them into what we now know is what the Jedi called the Shrine in the Depths, which is the dark core of the Jedi Temple. It's the Sith Shrine that we know exists underneath the Jedi Temple. The Jedi think they have tapped and suppressed for 
centuries, but in fact, we learn later on that Sidious was like, no, it's been weakening them this entire time. But they take the statues in there so they can put them in the space and then release the binding. They do that and there's nothing. And they realize with horror that they let just, they released the statues themselves are actually binding the darkness on the station and you them putting a binding, um, basically a binding spell, I would say, but a binding ritual over top of it, cancel the entire process out, and now they don't have anything to stop the darkness from spreading for the station, which was quite an unfortunate situation. But also when they return, Wraith realizes that Nan and Hog are actually Nile when he realizes the visuals of their ship and also the streaks in her hair are similar to what the Nile wear in their aesthetic. And he gets super um, bummed out because he realizes that she was coming from information and then that's all that there's multiple then overall then obviously coruscant is basically the way to, sh to shoot them back to the station is all the characters have different um uh motivations once they reach coruscant to on why they turn yeah. yeah yes and, and that I, was fun for me oh sorry Santa, you want to no, go that, that's right they had, they had that old crap moment right like we thought we knew what was going on they and, and i purposely didn't show this slide earlier because i didn't want to give away there up until this point, Wraith thinks that Nan is a friend. And he realizes, oh, holy smokes, these are Nihil. We've been interacting with Nihil this whole time. And now they're desperate to get back to the to the station because not only do they have to return these idols that were holding back some evil, but they need to stop these Nihil who could now know more about the Jedi and more about what's going on and use it against them. And it's a, a and they go to the the Jedi Council like uh, uh, guys. We got to go back, and they're like, "No, it's too dangerous. Just chill. It'll be all right." Right? Did you guys guess at all that they were Nile beforehand? I did not. No. I guessed the moment they showed up because I was like, "Their ships are specifically they're saved. They're saved as being very odd looking. They are they are very odd people, and their dynamic is strange because it's never fully explained what they're doing. They mention later on that Nan's like." Oh, my people, and you return me to my people. And then also they mentioned that she's seen a lot of like conflicts in the past. And I'm like, oh yeah, I bet you have. I bet you have seen a lot. Of <laughs> I'm like, it was very instantly to me. Then I was, I was wondering at that point, then when are they going to betray them? But they don't until much later on, once they've actually after they've left and come back. But I will say, Nan is a real dick because she figured out <laughs> that Des were on the station and knew that Des had been transported off the station rather than actually being incinerated, but she didn't tell anyone. Yeah. And it was just like, you suck. You so suck so much, even if you hate the Jedi. And you, you admit to Reith that you owe him a debt if you don't tell him this secret because it's a like, denial and there are no greater loyalty in that. that so so well. you think that Nan knew that he was transported away to the Drengear homeworld? Well, yes. I think that's what she was doing down there, right? He finds her down there investigating the rings. I don't know if she knew exactly I just that Bess had survived. Was investigating. I didn't think she actually knew what they were doing. I yeah. think she knew because when she goes down there and she's investigating, and then Reith puts together later on that he thinks she knows. But overall, why would the Nile suddenly turn up at the station beyond it being super old? And then they are clearly after the pod because they discuss how the technology works. I think her down there, she figured it out because she figured it out, but then she didn't tell anyone and then kept it hidden and then returned because Hog and her say that they were, they're the last group, they're the last of their group remaining after the um, after the great disaster. They have to give something up to the others to make them so they survive. And they give them the station and the secret that it has these powerful paws. That's, I think that's you right. I think you did on the money, yeah. Well, I wasn't, uh -huh. I, was, I definitely wasn't perceptive as you. I didn't get it from the I beginning. Didn't get but, that. But well, I but I did. I think I did get that they were now before because there's a moment when they are separating. So when and this this is part of my one of my criticisms of the book is there are two separate trips to the station, and I think the second one is really fun and fast. But I think that it could have all just been one. Um, but 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 besides that, there's a moment when they're parting ways. Non and Reith are parting ways, and he says, "Our paths will cross again." And Non sort of mutters to herself, "Paths will cross." And the whole time I hadn't been really thinking about them as Nile, but the Nile use the path engines to traverse and to travel. And she gets really hung up on this word path. And I, that's when I clicked for me that I was like, oh, I think I see what's going on here. Oh, so you guys are way smarter than Santa. I, uh, I was clueless. And I was like, holy smokes, uh, my goodness. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so they go back and, and because uh, Wraith had saved Nan's life before, uh, she owes him this debt because they, she kind of catches him. And he's uh, he's 
at her will. And she's like, oh, get out of here. Now we're even kind of thing. And uh, he discovers that that uh, Des uh, was transported in, in quite an odd way. He goes down into the to the lower rings and uh, he is transported to the Dringer's home. Uh, and, and it's very interesting. So I, I talk a little bit about this hyperspace pods. They've, they've, this this uh, a Maxine station, or not, a, uh, it, it is full of these uh, pods that are pre-programmed to certain locations and they, they jettison out at hyperspace and then they come out of hyperspace on the other end um, to be drawn in by tractor beams. And uh, he finds himself in one of these pods unknowingly. It pops out of hyperspace and there he is. He gets, uh, he gets uh, 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 drugged down to the planet and that's, uh, and he's fascinated because again, he's a big student of uh, the library uh, he he, uh, he sees this as a great opportunity to learn. And then Dringer come out and he's like, hey, fellas, you're kind of cool. And they're like, meet. And he's like, oh, well, that's rude. But you're kind of cool. And they're like, we're, we're going to get the other meat and we'll have this meat fight the other meat and then we'll eat them. Uh, so <laughs> that's when we learned that Dez is still alive. Uh, and they've, they've been drugging him, trying to learn about him. And uh, they have... Des fight with uh, uh, Ray. Yeah. And uh, and of course, we've already established that Des was a superior lightsaber guy. Wraith wasn't so much into it. And now we've got a drugged Des fighting a, a, a healthy Wraith and, tr and trying not to, not to kill Des in the process. Des doesn't care if he kills Wraith because he's drugged and doesn't really understand what's going on. And they're able to connect through their master and, and reference back to her, which was, I'm, I'm thankful, I'm thankful, Levi, that you had me add her back to the slide because um, the, he said, what would our master tell you? And, and that kind of breaks his thought process. And um, they're able to escape back to the station in, the, in another pod that's pre-programmed to go to the station um, with a drinker hot on their heels. Uh, and so we get back to the station uh, with a very damaged uh, Des and Wraith, who is trying to keep the Drengear from taking over. Meanwhile, the Drengear on the station are awake because they took off the uh, statues that were keeping them from being uh, dangerous. And we've got a hot mess. There's, there's a battle going on everywhere. And, um, and so he's got to stop, first of all, the drain gear from coming. Uh, and, and then secondly, they need to deal with the ones that are there. And I thought it was kind of brilliant what he did or what they did. Uh, and I, uh, you have to remind me which one of them came up with using those, uh, droids. It was Orla. Orla. Yeah. So they, there, there are, uh, droids on the station that care for the plants so they've got, trimmers and things like that on them. And um, they, they learn quickly that cutting a dringer in half doesn't kill them. Um, they just kind of reform. And then uh, they get the idea that let's set these droids against them. And they cut loose some of the, the foliage. It falls down on the dringer. The dringer start tearing up the foliage. So the, the droids attack the dringer. That lets them get loose. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, there's a there's a bunch of Nihil who are there, and the Nihil are a problem. The, that's this is the third act. You've got all this action going on. You've got Wraith going to the Dringer planet. Wraith and Des fighting. The Dringer and the Nihil and the everybody like going at it on the station. Uh, it's a fantastic series of events. And something about the Dringer that uh, people who are listening might be interested in is that they had some sort of relationship with the Sith in the past. And it was the Sith who actually put up those idols and imprisoned them. Because when the Drengear uh, see the Jedi, they're like, oh, it's who put us in there. And one of the other Drengear is like, no, they had red lightsabers. And we actually know from yeah, the High Republic comic run 
that, yeah, so the Sith tried to manipulate the Drengir and use them as tools of destruction, you know, way back when, but eventually the Drengir sort of turned on the Sith and the Sith had to imprison them. And so that's that's the, the you know, why these plants, the or plant-like creatures are connected to the darkness. They have a pretty close connection to the Sith. So I thought that was pretty fun. Yeah. That's a plus. That's a possibility because we don't know exactly what happened on the station because in the comics they mention the great progenitor, which is also locked up on the station. We don't see it in this book at all. We don't see a great progenitor like a large Drengir or any certain creature on the station, which is like they do have leaders because they are larger or they whack their subordinates with their plant arms. But we don't see their quote unquote their um, great progenitor. And they mention how they reached the galaxy with the Sith, but then the Sith turned on them and locked them away and they got stuck, which is going to be interesting to explore later on the battle line. But I really love the Drenger because they are very fun. And yeah, the, like the, the, like the, the, the three way of the Jedi, the Drenger, and the Nile are fascinating because then it's on a three way because then the Nile and the Drenger just go at it because the Drenger want to feast and consume a giant army, which suddenly popped up. And they mentioned that they're basically spoiling for a fight and that's just that, that that's a fun thing to think about like wow they are really pissed off and they don't want to they don't care about the jedi they just want to eat and then they i, am, I right. actually think that uh purple rod that marky and roe has at the end of the light of the jedi and then, you know how non talks to him at the end of this book i was thinking that maybe that is a way for him to awaken and control the the, the trend gear later Really fascinated by whatever that is and what its power is, for sure. So someone in the chat said that they were yeah, they left and they were wondering if this is the same book. Yes, this is the same book, and I, like your your you know confusion is part of my criticism. Where I think it is pretty, uh, there, there's some differences in the plot in the first half and the second half. It is it does feel very different in the two sides of, of the station in the two visits to the station. But yes, it is it is the same book. Yeah. Um, so we have this giant battle of uh, multiple. You know, uh, forces. You got Drangir, you got Nile, you got the Jedi, uh, all doing battle. And then um, Wraith gets the idea we need to stop these uh, pods from being able to travel. And just as everybody's getting ready to escape, he runs down to uh, reprogram everything and shoot the pods off into Nowhereville so they can never be used again. The Drangir can't come in on them. Nobody can go out on them. They're all gone. So that ends the uh, the threat of this station to the Republic. Now, whoever occupies it, occupies it. Doesn't matter. It's just a station. Yeah. To uh, explain to the viewers, yeah. So the Nile and the Drenger, these pods can essentially go anywhere in the galaxy pretty fast. And the Nile are all about speed, and the Drenger want to spread themselves. So these the station and this pod, these pods would allow them to sort of get behind enemy lines and strike pretty fast wherever they would want to. And that would really be, you know, bad for the Republic. So this, that's that's what the importance of the pods is. So, yeah. Yes, very good. And, uh, so a question arises because, again, people like to argue about things and, and, and make controversy out of nothing. But maybe it's nothing, maybe it's not. What are your thoughts about the hyperspace pods? Does it break any lore? Does it break any rules for hyperspace travel with gravity wells and so on? Uh, that them being able to uh, go directly into hyperspace from the station. Well, they do mention in the book that like there's a specific explanation for why this is able to do it. There's these things called helix rings, which are like these supercharged, like they can't, there's so much power that if you put them in a normal ship, it would, you know, too much power to explode. And so these rings, uh, you know, sort of supercharge these pods and are able to shoot them across the galaxy. And that's, you know, to tie back a conversation earlier, that's we didn't. I don't think we really covered it, but this station was being used as sort of a bypass smuggling ring, and they were using this really dangerous method by the buying guild. Scover was to send people. The, she would send her indentured servants to use this method of super dangerous travel, and sometimes it backfires. And this is why Affy's parents died. And so she discovers that the station is connected to the buying guild, and that's what ultimately drove her to confront Scover. But yeah, I think there was enough of an explanation of a, you know, they brought in something new to explain why this is the way it is. That For me, it didn't affect that. Well, no, and, and the, those helix rings, if they misfire, they can evaporate a person instantly. That's why they thought Des was dead. Yeah. Right. I uh, see that Reefer Man Reviews just said Yoda sees that purple rod that Marky and Roe has 
in yeah, and issue one of three. the book issue three, and I haven't read that. I was just kind of, I don't know what happens with that. Now I'm very We don't confused. know. He just sees it. And he just, he, he he goes, just sees it from like afar or somebody holding it? He, no, it's Yoda, a, Yoda it's picks a it up. Yeah, it's, a, it's in a box. Yoda opens a box on a ship, a Nile ship, and sees this rod and is like, what the heck is this? And it, it's a moment of um, action, so to say, and so he has to leave. Uh, but I and Markeon Row is not there. It's not Markeon's no, ship. It is Markeon. Markeon Row is there. Markeon Row is there. Yeah. Um, you need to read I that. Think, yeah, I think that there's. We'll get answers with that, Rod. I think your theory about controlling the Dren gear is, is cool. I think that's cool. Uh, Hydra, what do you think? Uh, oh, Doctor McGuire asked the question: the Rivals get rings get outlawed like disruptor rivals. I don't know. They, it's described in the book that they there have been a a series of accidents on board of the station with the fuel substance for the helix being siphoned out or the helix like rings being used that causes, it seems like a 50-50 death count from like what um, Affy like describes in like her research of these different um, markings of these smuggler glyphs and so on. So I think the helix, helix rings are fine as the explanation. I don't really find an issue with because like, I don't know. Hyperspace has always been a little bit wibbly wobbly, timey wimey in terms of Star Wars, even in Legends and now in Canon about how time works. And then for, mostly, for me, it's mostly just like, what's the class of engine? If it's super high class, and this space station is clearly very advanced because it has survived for at least over a thousand years, probably, of more, maybe even many more thousands. We didn't even know how old the station is. And it's clearly very advanced and highly technical and It'll be interesting to see, and maybe someday in the very far future, what this station looked like in its prime, or how these pods were used back in the very ancient times of the Republic. So, well, they, they weren't used for good because the Amaxines were warriors that were battling against everybody. So it's always, I, th I would say, it always been used for nefarious reasons. Yeah, yeah. Oh, of course. But like in that, when we get to that point, we're gonna have to see them do that, use that kind of technology, and see how it functions, or like how their ships interact with the vessels. Because um, like the ships are mentioned as being very strangely configured, like the Amaxi and the vessels, and it's possible they connect to the pods in some unique way, or there's some different mechanisms across the galaxy. Like there are mentioned that there are tractor beams down to the Drengiers, quote unquote, home world, yeah. and then they release the pod back up. And it'd be interesting to see if there are like different way stations on where they are. That's all for the future. So I don't have an issue at all with the helix rings of the pods. They were very fun and a very interesting mechanism to shoot someone out of like out of range of the force because when they try to feel where Des is, they can't feel him in the force. So clearly they've gone a ways away or somewhere um, quite far at least. Yeah. And I, I would think the Drengear's homeworld is very far because nobody knows about them. And we don't we don't necessarily know that that's the home world either. That's yeah, that's the that's a put in home world. It's referenced yeah. multiple times that he's like, well, there's just they were there. I don't know if it's the home world. That's oh, oh, okay. yeah. he even he asked them, know. is this your home world or were you brought here? They never answered. They, they never brought. answered, yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, we want to you. For the viewers, so the Amaxines by this point are already stuff of legend, and so Reef being a scholar and Comac as well knows about them. And so they're sort of think of them like Mandalorians. They were a warrior people. And they, um, and eventually the le the lore is that they left the galaxy in search of another fight because the fight in the galaxy wasn't so great. And so the Amaxians you see later on in Bloodline, which is closer to the sequel trilogy, these are like ex Imperials who took the name and have been like fighting under this name Amaxine. But the actual Amaxine warriors themselves have been, as far as I know, long long gone. Like we don't know what they look like. Like they reference in the book that one of the ne'er do wells in the first part of the station like finds the really valuable armor and. So like the Maxims themselves are stuff of legend at this point. So yeah, it's really impressive that this station uh, is the way it is. But to answer the question about the helix rings that someone had in the chat, I don't even know if it was that they were outlawed. It's that just, it wasn't cost effective. Like they were really, it's too much. It, it didn't, it, did, it doesn't really work in a practical sense. So it didn't have wider uh, galaxy wide application. Yeah. Um, so so I, I kind of want to move the story forward a little bit. Um, it, it, uh, we get to a point where Wraith then comes back up and he realizes like we've got a bigger problem here. Uh, the, the ship as you mentioned earlier uh, and let me just uh, switch over here again, let folks see. These are the Drengear, right? And I saw somebody making fun of it uh, that it was like too much like Swamp Man but you know, hey, we've not seen this kind of thing in Star Wars but 
um, the 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 interesting part here is that let me see if I can bring it up. Uh, though, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Levi, these these plants were coming out and trapping vessels to the station, and uh, the vessel that they needed to escape on was completely locked in with these plants. And uh, he realizes like, everybody's gonna be stuck here pretty soon and this temporary measure is not gonna work. So he decides he's gonna open the, the station to let people or let everything get sucked out into space. And uh, he's willing to die if that's what the case is. He opens the, the airlock and sure enough, everything gets sucked out, like everything, <laughs> gone. And uh, in that event, uh, he is nearly sucked out. But all of a sudden, Geode shows up and he lands on Geode and Geode holds him from, from uh, it, 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 Geode is planted enough into or, or has a solid enough foundation that he can't be sucked out into space. And because Wraith lands against Geode, he's saved from getting sucked out into space. And then uh, the the uh, the vacuum is closed. Uh, uh, the atmosphere is uh, replaced, and uh, the Geode has saved the day. Uh, so that's the time where we know for sure that Geode is not just a rock, right? <laughs> we kind of mentioned it earlier. This is the point where we know for sure uh, that Geode's not a rock and that he is a sentient being. And just to mention uh, about Wraith's um, journey throughout the book, because this is the, this is the bookmark ending. But at the beginning, he's extremely sure of himself because he's like, I'm going to stay in Coruscant. No, I'm not. I really hate it. I'm putting my heels in, but he goes anyway because he wants to. But then as we go through the book, like there's a lot of complications, and then Des dies, and he gets very um, depressed, essentially. And then as he's on, when he's on the ship, he doesn't know his master has died, so he's writing this report talking about how we really shouldn't be out here. We're like, like Des is dead, and like there's all this chaotic stuff. There's all these all these different people who we don't know about. We should probably study them more in the archives and so on and so forth. And then he finds out that she's dead, and that kind of destroys him. And then he learns that Nan is also a betrayer, and then he gets really um, upset. And then in that moment, when he gives when, he, when he's when he's venting the station, he's venting the pods. There's a moment, I think, in the book specifically that he basically is like, I'm coming, Master, and he's kind of not committing suicide, but he's like, if I die, so be it, because I'm, I feel this he's, Yeah, it just says he's sad. Yeah, yeah. he's and not. Then and then Geode whacks him, and then he's like, what? And then there's this um, surge of emotion because he feels Geode, and that, that's a very that's a very nice clincher for his moment because it helps heal all of the pain he's felt. Also, Dez is alive, which is very which is very useful, of course. But then he feels all this, like, emotion he understands the need to continue on that's a very nice moment yeah i agree i agree it's a really nice and like we said this third act is so busy it's really exciting it's it's a great story uh it's claudia gray it, it's some of her best and maybe the book as a whole isn't your favorite we'll kind of do a summary here in a moment so but anyway they, they they're able to escape they go back to coruscant and everything else plays out um the the uh, oh shoot, um, Affy gives up her her uh, her mom right, um, uh, and and the immediately the Republic goes. They arrest her. They completely break down the bin or bind guild. It's gone, and all the assets go out to the people who have the the, the stuff. Uh, 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 technically, Leox should have got ownership of the vessel. But Leox is like, nope, I'm, uh, I'm going to give it to Affy. And he says uh, that it belongs to her. So the, the Republic licenses, if you want to say, or registers the vessel in Affy's name. She keeps the name of the vessel, the vessel. And um, she's the presumptive owner, but still she's the co-pilot. And really, Leox is the pilot, and he's really in charge. But she technically owns it and and everything else kind of wraps up um you see uh wraith finalizes his journey and he decides he's going to go back with uh well he asks he asks uh comac to be his jedi master Je uh, comac agrees um and 
Um, um, oh, shoot. Um, Orla? Yeah, no. Uh, I was thinking uh, the other guy, Des. Des. Des decides to take this other oath of something new that we've seen. And I saw somebody mention in the chat earlier. Des decides to take this sort of monastic oath that he's just going to go to um, the place and do nothing but meditate in the force for the rest of his life or and the, the barrage vow. Yeah. yeah, for the foreseeable future. That's all he's going to do. Fascinating. Yeah. Another another aspect of the Jedi Order that we've never heard about. Well, as I mentioned before, yeah, we saw it. There was the, the Jedi Master in Dar the Darth Vader Charles Soul 2017 run who during Order 66, he was one of the few Jedi during this vow and so he had been off. And so Vader is tasked with going to confront this Jedi and ultimately is the Jedi who Vader gets his crystal from and turns that crystal red and that becomes Vader's red lightsaber. So we had seen this vow before um, in canon and it was cool to see it again here. I'm interested to see, I think we'll return and we'll see Des in the future because the Barash vow is not involuntary because you take it and then you return when you think you're completed because with him, he he, he completed his vow when Vader arrived because he's like, okay, the Jedi are almost dead. I need to kill you and kill your master. And then he goes off to do that. I'm interested to see if, because we don't know the time span of like the High Republic content launch. There's been talks and like theories talking about time jumps and time skips. I'd be fascinated to see Des in the future after he's been healed from his experience with the Dren Gear, because the Dren Gear mess him up very badly. They are they are established as a very real threat to Jedi and the Force users. And I'm interested to see him in the future after he's taken the Barash vow, how he looks and how he acts differently from what we've seen here. This highly adventurous, very impulsive type character. Yeah, yeah, and, I would like to see that too. And I, I got the impression too he took that vow because he wasn't healed. He still had some. Yeah. Psychological issues, some physical issues remain. Issues with the Force, really. His mental, yeah. like the Drengir really messed up his connection with the Force because so he spent some time there as their prisoner and they interrogated him and, you know, filled the, him with poison and adrenaline and he struggled to maintain his connection to the Force. And so even though he got it back after he was healed, he isn't on like good terms per se. With the force, so to speak, and so he feels the need to go reconnect, and that's that's why he takes the vow. That was the way I read it, anyway. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. And and Orla, uh, we mentioned her, so we know that uh, Des is taking this vow. Uh, Wraith and Comac are going to go together out into the outer rim, and they're going to go uh, out uh, on a mission out there. Uh, and we see Orla; she buys a brand new ship shiny, bright, pretty, and uh, she's going to go out and continue this Wayfinder, Wayseeker um, uh, kind of path that she's on. Uh, and, and that kind of wraps up the story as a whole. Uh, so uh, anything else you'd add that I kind of skipped over uh, that, that add more context to folks? Um, well, the book, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Nan we turned to Marcion Rowe and filled him in on about everything she had learned about the Jedi and the station. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I, will, I will also mention the, the, um, the connecting point throughout the whole thing of the story that's in six parts of the background of the two, of, of Komak Vetus and Orla Girani. The point of that ultimately is that it sets up Orla as having questioned the Jedi Order and questioning how the Force works, which is why throughout the whole course of the book, which is why she's being a way seeker about going out and feeling the force and following its tug. While for Comac Vetus, um, his master dies on the mission, Simic's, Master Simic dies, and he can't get over the loss due to so many different multiple small reasons. And it stays with him for 25 years, and then this event flares it up really rather, rather directly. And at the very end of the novel, um, before the epilogue where um, Nan goes back to um, uh, Marquion Rowe, there's this moment between Orla when she contacts him via her ship and is like, are you going to stay with the Order? And then he's like, yes, I have a new Padawan now. And then that they move forward with that. Um, but then she senses that he isn't going to work with the Order, that, he, that she feels that he isn't ready or he isn't a fit for the Order anymore because of what happened in the past. So I, I think he might be another member of the Lost 20 at some point in the future, maybe. Or yeah. all through having Wreath by his side, all that stuff heals. And that'll be interesting story to also going forward. That's yeah. 
Hydra, I'm glad you mentioned the Lost 20. And again, for folks that may not be familiar, in the Jedi Temple, you see these statues of, of um, Jedi Masters that left the Order, the Lost 20, right? So um, you could it's be a deleted there. scene from Attack of the Clones. You can see Obi-Wan and Jocasta Nu, the Jedi Librarian, looking at a bust of Dooku, I believe, in that in, in the film. And if Orla Jereni is Ahsoka, as we've talked about, then Comac Vitus is definitely Qui-Gon Jinn. He talks about how it's referenced, and this isn't any internal narration, this is just purely Claudia Gray writing this, but that he, the character, buries his pain, and like a mine, 25 years later, you know, it's going to come up and explode. And that's, I think, what we're, you know, what we sort of see that, because, uh, you know, while, you know, Claudia Gray really writes the Jedi well, and this is, she writes both this cool new era where we see Jedi as more good and democratic with their usage of the Force, but also she presents characters who, even in this time period, have problems with the Jedi, and Orla and Comac especially have some problems with the way to go about things. And it's yeah, it's really it's really interesting to read, um, especially Orla, who because the the reason why she has this vergence is in the hostage rescue of the two, you know, of the of the two monarchs. Yeah, one of them dies because she doesn't act on what the Force is telling to her, and she instead thinks of the Order and no, I can't do that. And it's a very quick moment and she lets someone die and that really impacted her as a young padwan to be like i think that i should listen to the force more over than the code of the jedi and that's why she ultimately set on this path as a and, and Komat's master died in that and so he was overcoming that as well so they were both overcoming that negative part of that together i think yeah. that's what brought them so close together yeah um their pain did, their shared pain yeah and i wanted to point out um in the book, this was mentioned many times. Um, Jora asked Reef, uh, "How come no Jedi can cross the Kyber Arch alone?" Yes. And and the whole the whole time, Reef is asking Jedi and Padawans like, "How?" Because every there and everybody's like, "I don't know." People cross it alone all the time. And at the end of the book, he says that he figured out the answer to the question, and it's because. Um, the arch itself wouldn't exist if it wasn't for all the Jedi that came before. And that was what his master was trying to teach him before she died. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I uh, just want to wrap it up uh, uh, at the end. What are your overall, we kind of mentioned at the beginning, overall impressions of the book. I liked it. I read it through twice. Not my favorite Claudia Gray book. Uh, 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 Levi's mentioned a couple of times my favorite is Master and Apprentice. But uh, and, and I know Gray, you you have a favorite. As Lost well. Stars. Yeah. So yeah, Lost Stars I think remains my favorite as well. Yeah. Where would you put this in Claudia Gray's uh, content that you've read? Would it be bottom, bottom, middle? Bottom. 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 I put this. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Levi. Oh, I would put this above Leia, Princess of Alderaan, personally for me, hmm. but below, but below Master and Apprentice and uh, Lost Stars. Excellent. I, and, I think uh, right in the middle uh, for me. Yeah, Hydra, what do you think? Uh, I've, I have, unfortunately, have not read Lost Stars. I've heard everything about it at this point, so I'm kind of like, do I want to read it? Because I already know everything that's going to happen in it, unfortunately. But it's worth the read. I, it's so good. It, it is. I, I might someday, yes, don't worry. I've read her other material in Star Wars. Um, I personally think that I can't really judge it very well because this is just the beginning of a much longer story. Like, this is the introduction of the characters, but as it stands, I think it's at the top, really, because she gets really crazy with it. She gets a lot of creativity stuff. She isn't no, she isn't as constricted as badly or as much in the in the previous stuff where she had to tell a story about Leia specifically and like this period of her life. This she just goes crazy, and as um, as was mentioned, that it, perhaps it feels a bit um, the the tone of it shifts like in the middle, and it doesn't feel quite right, or like it's very it's a rather drastic change. But I really love that because I was like. Okay, we're going, and there's giant plant people, and there's a giant army that suddenly showed up, and there's Piper Space Positive who might be doing the world. Okay, we have to stop all this right now. It's a very um, escalation, yeah. which is kind of, I enjoyed that escalation. It was like, oh boy, this is, this is getting much more serious than what we thought. So that's what I enjoyed about the book. I really enjoyed the book overall. Yeah. I forgot to mention I Bloodline, too. Sorry. I love Bloodline. Bloodline. Yeah, Bloodline. I would put Bloodline at the top. I mm -hmm. forgot to mention Bloodline is yeah. my favorite. That's, that's one of my favorites. But my personal favorite is um, the Aftermath series. And to me, I go, is it as good as the Aftermath series? No, not so far. Well, but it, Claudia is not the author of that. So, but no. so just among. I just in general of how yeah. I like, how I look at Star Wars books. I go, was it as good sure. as the Aftermath? Yes or no. <laughs> 
Well, I uh, as far as Claudia's works that I, that I've consumed, I, I would probably put it at the bottom for now. And and I think Hydra and, and uh, Levi, you both kind of touched on. It. We don't know the whole story yet. I may come back to this later and have ad adoration for it. It could be one of my favorites of all time. But for now, where it stands today, I would put it at the at the least of Claudia Gray novels. Now, the least of Claudia Gray novels is still quite high. Yeah. I agree. I don't want to. I don't want to put it in context where uh, you know I didn't like it. I did like it uh, overall for me. Uh, I, I like to give things like a, a school letter grade. For me, it's a, maybe a B, B minus, but, but that's still really good. <laughs> yeah, I, I give it a B. Solid, yeah, solid B. Yeah. yeah. Very for me, good. anyway. Yeah. Well, guys, I, it, it, uh, I truly, truly appreciate the discussion we've had tonight. Mrs. Claus is starving to death. She's waiting for Santa to come up and have dinner. Oh, I really appreciate the time you've taken. Everybody here in the chat, you've been wonderful this evening. Uh, we've kind of avoided some of the uh, elephant in the room. I'll give uh, uh, Levi a chance to address it again at the end. But uh, I, I want to thank you so much for being here. I've, I've enjoyed this discussion thoroughly. And I hope that folks coming along are interested in the High Republic, interested in this novel, maybe don't know a lot about it, aren't interested in reading it, are able to take away enough of the story to know what's going on. And I think we've done a great job. Appreciate uh, your insights, you've, you've done uh, tremendously. So, uh, uh, <laughs> Levi, I'll let you uh, uh, give a little bit of a, of a farewell, and, and, and thanks so much. I really wanted to reach out to Levi today because of what happened last night. And a lot of people, that's the only introduction they've had. And we wanted to keep the content tonight about content. We wanted to talk about this book. And Levi, you've you've uh, done a fabulous job. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I hope to have you again sometime. Yeah. Well, you know, if there is, if for anyone who's still staying, and if there is that elephant in the room for you, I mean, I am passionate about having conversations. And if you'd like to reach out, I'd love, you know, I'd love to talk to you. Oh, hey, Goldman, that's awesome that you're here. Um, I'm a big fan of your content. Uh, but if you know, if you have a disagreement with me, I would love to explain to you. And I really, you know, I recognize that. Clearly, I made a mistake. I didn't mean to bring such negativity to that space, but I do believe in my message, and I think that, you know, ultimately, we as fans will be able to talk to each other. And no matter what happens, I, I I do see a bright future for all of us. And like I said, if you have a disagreement with me, I would I'm so I would open a dialogue. And I haven't personally been reading the chat because I've been focused on the discussion, but also I am was a little bit fearful. I must admit, I've been getting a lot of uh, angry comments in the past 24 hours, uh, but. You know, if you disagree with me, I think that's fine. Uh, I recognize that I may have, you know, put some people the wrong way, but I hope going forward that we can just talk about Star Wars and share our love for Star Wars. And I really appreciate Santa having me on and giving me a sort of second chance here. And if you want to check me out and, you know, what we do at, over at All New Nerds, I mean, I think a really good example is we just interviewed Star Wars Only, who has a hugely, you know, different belief in Star Wars than all of the, you know, everyone else. And it's, it's great. It's such a great discussion. And yeah, I would love for you guys to join me in, my passion for Star Wars, and yeah, I don't know. I have nothing but positive things to say, and I appreciate everyone for watching this far. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Hydra, uh, uh, give your chance for farewell. Hi, guys. Thank you very much for having me on. It was a very pleasure to be the guest from um, Alex's server uh, here today. It was very enjoyable. I really enjoyed talking about this book, because I really do love the High Republic, and I really look forward to the stuff coming out in the future. Well, thank you so much for accepting the invite. I kind of just threw out there to folks uh, begging for somebody to come on to help fill Lord Callis's shoes uh, who couldn't be here with us tonight. And you've uh, done a fabulous job. Uh, some of your insights were tr absolutely uh, tremendous. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. And of course, Gray, uh, my dear friend, Gray, thanks for being here. We'll of course. Thanks for everybody who was in the chat the whole time supporting Mike Porter, Reefer Man Reviews, Dale Letterman. <laughs> Very good. And they were having a lot of fun with you, Gray. I know you saw those, you were interacting with them. Uh, we have a wonderful community here. Uh, if you've not subscribed to my channel, uh, give us a try. You know, Come yeah. check out some of the videos. We love to just talk about Star Wars and kind of keep the politics out of it, keep the- uh, keep it positive. Out of it. 
you won't come here and get yelled at like other Star Wars places. Right. I'm not going to I'm not going to do that. Uh, we try to we try to come together and, and we'll address some of the controversies as we did tonight. I thought we did a great job of addressing them and talking about them. And we try to do that all the time on the channel uh, and talk about the, the in, in kind of an open and uh, intellectual way. And uh, in where there are issues, we take issues and and that's fine. We don't have to get angry with one another or, uh, you know, put down uh, uh, somebody because they disagree with us. So I truly, truly, this was great tonight. Thank you all so much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Tomorrow, we're trying to do something else and uh, maybe I'll be able to get on, get caught up with work after vacation. And uh, as we get further into the week, get closer to uh, the Bad Batch. I, I'm yeah. super excited to talk about the Bad Batch. And we, we, we stay focused tonight on the High Republic. And, and uh, again, uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I can't wait to see you till uh, next time and uh, look for something new. Uh, very soon in the next day or so. And until then, as I always say, <laughs> Merry Christmas and may the force be with you. Bye-bye, everybody.